Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck and Jerry's here, too. And this is a good old-fashioned barn burner of a Stuff You Should Know type topic. Woo! Whiz bang. And Chuck, this was uh, somebody sent this in as a, a suggestion recently, I think, right? Yeah, you know, I think you and I had both been aware of this story, but mm-hmm. uh, we did get a recent suggestion from David Parcher. Yeah, David Parcher. I think so, uh, yeah. just a couple of weeks ago sent in oh. uh, this suggestion, and look at the timing. Yeah, well, thank you, David. And we're going to talk about another David, that is David Hahn, the nuclear Boy Scout. Yep. And this is one of those where we owe a, a huge debt to a, a single human uh, because this story was may have just gone fairly unnoticed as a, a pretty localized local newspaper item. Yeah. Uh, if it hadn't have been found uh, by a gentleman named Ken Silverstein, who ended up writing a very large piece in Harper's Magazine and then a book called The Radioactive Boy Scout, colon, the true story of a boy in his backyard nuclear reactor. So uh, <laughs> big thanks to Ken. A lot of this came from your work. Yeah, and shout out also to the um, journalist from the Natural Resources News Service, which is this investigative journalist group that um, just as a public good, look for, like investigate stories and then turn around and give them to news out- outlets. And apparently that's how Ken came across the story and began researching it. So there's two people that were responsible for it, at least. Yeah, and three, because we have to count David Hahn. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Michigan teenager who in the 90s uh, managed to create a nuclear reaction in the potting shed of his mom's house. Uh, It is a story that is interesting and amazing, uh, but also very sad uh, in its ending. Yeah, and technically we should thank five people because it took Patty and Ken Hahn to reproduce and create David Hahn. So we're at five people now that we need to thank. (laughs) All right. So David was born uh, October 1976. Uh, that's the year you were born, right? Yeah, I was just a couple months older than him. Yeah, and look what this guy did. Yeah, I know. <laughs> what What yeah. have you ever done? Thanks for that. <laughs> hey, you gotta you gotta hit podcast. So you're not sweating it. Oh, I'm sweating. <laughs> uh, when he was a little, and we say this because it very much figures into uh, the end of David's story. It's very sad, but his mother Patty was diagnosed with. Uh, depression and paranoid schizophrenia, uh, was hop- hospitalized through his early childhood off and on, and she would eventually uh, take her own life in 1996. Yeah, and that will play into the story later on. Uh, but Patty remains a character throughout most of it. So too does um, David's father, Ken, who we mentioned. He's person five we need to thank. Um, Patty and Ken got divorced, I think, when David was really little, like maybe a toddler. And uh, Ken ended up marrying a co-worker, uh, person number six, we need to thank Kathy Missig. Uh, Ken and Kathy uh, were both engineers at General Motors. This whole thing took place in the suburbs of Detroit, yeah. uh, specifically Clinton Township, Michigan. Specifically, uh, later on, in a, um, a subdivision called Gulf Manor, as we'll see. But um, so David uh, lives with Ken and Kathy. And then on weekends, he goes and stays with his mom, Patty, and her boyfriend, person number seven, who we need to thank, Michael Palasic. Uh, and they're the ones, I, li- I believe, who lived in Golf Manor. And under, by all accounts, like, David lived a pretty normal childhood, um, just doing normal childhood things. It wasn't until he was 10 that his life found its purpose, which is pretty early, if you think about it, for your life to find its purpose. Yeah. And by the way, if you live in Golf Manor, hold your emails. We know you're in Commerce Township. Yes. Thank you for that. I think is. His dad lived in Clinton Township. Yeah. It's probably like uh, where I lived in New Jersey. It's like all these old townships just run together. Yeah. That's what it looked like on the map. Yeah. So uh, the person we really need to thank. This is number eight, (laughs) person eight. uh, Is like you mentioned, when Dave was 10 years old, his stepmom's father, so I guess his step-grandfather, if you count that as a thing, uh, he was also an engineer at GM. He gave... Uh, little David, a book called The Golden Book of Chemistry Experiments. Mm-hmm. And little David was fascinated with uh, science and chemistry, but in particular with uh, the stories of uh, Mary and Pierre Curie and their radium discovery. And the glow, I think the glow of that whole thing really 
um, enthralled this young guy. Yeah, this book was heavily illustrated and like the instructions kind of looked, had the same look as like those Ripley's Believe It or Not oh, yeah. co- comic strips almost. Mm-hmm. Totally something that would appeal to a kid that age or a little older. Um, I, you can find it online in its entirety as a PDF. Um, and I looked at the illustration and I don't really know what he saw. And it's actually black and white. The glow is just some lines coming off of a beaker or whatever, but... Imagination, my friend. For some reason, it enthralled him so much so that within two years of receiving that book, he was um, devouring his father's chemistry textbooks at age 12. Yeah, so he was... I mean, these were books that were more advanced than his age. Clearly a smart guy. Uh, At the age of 14, he apparently made nitroglycerin by himself, uh, which evidently isn't the hardest thing to do, but is very dangerous to do. Uh, there are other stories like he brought, um, wanted to make his own fireworks at Boy Scout camp. So he brought some powdered magnesium, uh, it ended up catching on fire and ruined a tent. So, uh, what else? He, he, he tried to develop a self tanning method that didn't work out. Right. <laughs> yeah. He overdosed on canthazanthin, which, uh, I can't remember which one, the, which episode that came up in. Uh, but it's a pigment that turns your skin orange from the inside out, and that's what he did. He was trying to come up with a self-tanning uh, method that didn't use any kind of UV radiation. Yeah, no comment. But he was that kind of dude. He would just turn up at, like, a scout meeting or something bright orange and be like, yeah, too much canthazanthin. So, yeah, he's exactly that kid. He's also the kind of kid who essentially destroys his bedroom <laughs> Because he's doing science. Uh, the The walls were wrecked. Uh, the carpet was stained. They had to move the carpet out. Eventually, his dad was like, listen, uh, this is getting serious. You're destroying our home. Um, you got to move into the basement, first of all. And when we're not here, you can't be in here either. Uh, they, they took away uh, equipment. They took away some chemicals. Mm-hmm. And finally, they said, all right, you're, this is out of hand. You, you can't do this anymore. So he said, all right, I'll do it like every uh, divorced kid says, I'll do it at the other parent's house. <laughs> That's right. Um, and so he did. He ended up setting up a lab in his mom's potting shed in Golf Manor in Commerce Township. And um, this is where the story really starts to kind of take off. Because um, his dad was getting really worried that his son was <clears throat> basically um, – um, creating and selling drugs. Like, that's what he was doing with his chemistry experiments. And so, like, they would, he and his um, stepmom would drop in in the library when he was supposedly there to see if he was there. Like, they really did not trust this fascination with chemistry. Which, I mean, I can understand. If your kid blows himself up a couple of times, you're like, what are you doing exactly here? (laughs) Yeah. So, I don't know if he knew that David went and set up a, a lab in his mom's potting shed or not, and just was like, it's fine as long as it's out of my house. I'm not sure. I've never seen that either way. But one thing that he did do to try to be like, okay, I think you're creating drugs. You're probably on them. You may or may not be selling them. None of those seem to be true from what I can tell. You need to become an Eagle Scout. And he pushed his son to become an Eagle Scout. Yeah, and that's exactly what he did, as we will later find out. Uh, But when it came time for merit badge selection, Mm -hmm. He said, I want the one uh, that says atomic energy. Yeah. And the scoutmaster said, uh, I, I think he told the, the writer of the book, um, no one had ever chosen that before in the history of the troop. Right. <laughs> so it kind of reminds me of the Brian Cox scene in Rushmore uh, with Bill Murray when he says he's one of the worst students we've got. <laughs> I can just picture Brian Cox saying that, that no one's ever tried for this badge before. But uh it was it was a legit badge. It's kind of funny that it existed. It's different now, as we'll see. But um, in 1963, they introduced the Atomic Energy Badge. Mm-hmm. It came with a pamphlet mm-hmm. uh, that they created with the nuclear energy industry that turned out to have a lot of really useful information, uh, almost like a starter kit on how to, like, source radioactive elements in the real world yeah. and and how to get your own reactor going. Yeah, the, one of the projects you could do was to build your own Geiger counter. Like, it was serious stuff. Yeah, maybe so legit that, uh, like I said, the Boy Scouts would eventually change that badge, uh, pr- I think probably because of what happened with David. Um, in 2005, they replaced it with the nuclear science badge. 
Yes. So, but he's still working on the original, the Atomic Energy Badge from 1963, right? Oh, yeah. So, um, he's just devouring this. He's having the, the best time. He visits a, a hospital ward to um, learn about x-rays, um, which is part of the, the merit badge certification. Um, the thing that really changed things, though, Chuck, is he decided uh, just these these things the merit badge was having him do, like one of the things was draw a, a di- diagram of a fission reaction yeah, or build a model of a nuclear reactor, but a model, yeah. like a cardboard right. model, basically, or paper mache. Like, or? Yes, or I will st- create my own nuclear um, reactor in my mom's potting shed. He he decided he was so psyched about atomic energy that he wanted to do it himself. Yeah. I mean, I guess you do the model and you're like, hey, this, that wasn't so hard. <laughs> right. Let me see if I can do it for real. Yeah. And he wanted to build. And, you know, this shows that he was a kid. I think I don't think this was to cause harm. He wanted to build a, a neutron gun. Mm-hmm. And the way I just for my research, this is speculation, but it, it didn't seem like he was like. I want to build a neutron gun to try and, like, blow up the the city that I live in. Not at all. It it seemed more like a a kid who was really into science and sci-fi and chemistry and wanted to make a little pew-pew gun. Yeah. I think neutron gun is a um, a misleading term. I can't get the Nintendo duck hunt gun out of my head whenever I hear neutron gun. (laughs) But really what a neutron gun is, at least the one that David made, it's a block of lead with a cavity carved out and you put radioactive material in the cavity and then cover it over with like aluminum foil. And then you just point the, the aluminum foil side of that block of lead at what you want to irradiate. And then you try to start a chain reaction, a nuclear reaction. That seems to be the sum total of his goals. He wasn't trying to build a bomb. He wasn't yeah. trying to sell plutonium to the Libyans. He wasn't doing anything like that. (laughs) He just wanted to see if he could start a nuclear chain reaction, this thing that had fascinated him since he was 10 years old. And so he set about doing that with help from this um, Eagle Scout merit badge pamphlet. Yeah, yeah, totally. Which makes the whole thing that much more nuts. Yeah, and also by adopting a a persona as a professor – because he starts writing into organizations trying to get uh, information, mm-hmm. trying to get materials, trying to get schematics. He said he was Professor Han that taught at his high school, Chippewa Valley High School. Ooh, go and, chipmunks. Uh, are they? I don't know. Okay. They better be. Uh, and over the next few years, basically, uh, and apparently, you know, he he applied himself. He didn't apply himself in school. He was smart, but he was failing almost failing out, basically, barely passing like the math and English exams needed to graduate eventually. But Mm -hmm. uh, that is to say these letters had like spelling errors and grammatical errors. It didn't seem like they were written by a professor, but people bought it. And before you know it, he's like corresponding as a professor to these adults. Yeah. And these adults are just totally into this correspondence. They're really enjoying helping this who they think a high school physics teacher learn um, the stuff he's looking for about nuclear energy to ostensibly go and teach to the kids, right? So this correspondence is like genuine. The only thing um, illegitimate about it was that he was misrepresenting who he actually was, yeah, a professor rather than a high school student. But other than that, everything else about it seems to be pretty neat. Yeah, except for the fact that it's dangerous and illegal. <laughs> yes. So one of the people that he um, corresponded with, I think he corresponded with him the most, was named Donald Erb, E-R-B. And he was the guy who was the head of the department that produces isotopes. If you need isotopes, um, you can go to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. This is not you, but like if you are in some sort of industry that uses isotopes. Herb um, will hook you up. And this herb will be like, I got you. I got you covered. (laughs) For some reason, they come in these little baggies with like um, card suits printed all over them. It's weird. That's an herb kind of touch. It's so nice. But he was uh, he worked for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and nobody helped um, David Hahn more than Donald Erb did, again, unwittingly. Yeah, absolutely. So should we take a break? We should. Okay. All right. I was about to keep going, but let's take a break, and we're going to talk about his pursuit of radioactive materials right after this. <laughs> Bye. 
By the way, Chuck, it's the Chippewa Valley Big Red, which appears to be a giant cardinal. Oh. If you ask me, that was a that was a missed missed Stop. opportunity. Yeah. Chipmunks. Chippewa chipmunks, the v- rabid chipmunks. Yeah, I love it. All right, so when we left off, David Hahn was getting serious about building this uh, nuclear reactor. Um, he needs material to do that. So, uh, and we should point out that, uh, you know, I said it was dangerous. It was dangerous. He did know this. He still pursued it, but he, like, he had a lead shield uh, that he worked with. He threw away his contaminated clothes. He left his shoes in there and didn't take them in his house. So It was like his driving like, shoes, but in a potting <laughs> shed that he was building a breeder reactor in. Do you have driving shoes? Is that a thing? Uh, I know that it's a thing from watching old episodes of Frasier. I've never heard that. Yes, you've seen driving shoes. People wear them, and they're totally unaware that you're not supposed to wear them out of your car. But it's like if your car is so nice, you take off your outdoor shoes and put on uh-huh. your driving shoes that never leave your car. <laughs> And that way you don't get wow. your car dirty. Yeah, I don't know if I have seen them. I guess I just you have. Maybe you didn't. They're like they look kind of like um, a cross between a loafer and a moccasin. And then the dead giveaway is the the tread on the bottom comes up the back of the heel as well because of the position that your foot is in when you're driving. It gives you grip. All right, I'm gonna have to look this up. You've seen them. All right. Uh, all right. So <laughs> that's amazing. Fifty two years old. Never knew about this. I was only probably 40 when I learned about it, so I don't feel bad. Yeah. All right. So uh, he starts looking for materials. Um, and these are just a few sort of stories about he would go about that. Uh, he wanted some americium-241 mm-hmm. for this neutron gun. Uh, in the booklet that he got from the from the Boy Scouts, uh, said you can get this stuff in smoke detectors. So he tries to steal them from the Boy Scout camp. <laughs> Uh, got caught and sent home early. Uh-huh. Uh, then he writes smoke detector companies saying, I need a bunch of these things for a school project. Eventually, one company sold him 100 broken ones for 100 bucks. Yeah. Couldn't figure out how to find this americium, so got in touch with another smoke detector company who was like, oh, well, here's where you find it, and was able to extract americium uh, enough to like weld together with a blowtorch. Yes. So remember I was talking about the neutron gun is a a lump of lead with a cavity hollowed out. And then you put your radioactive material in the the cavity of lead. Now we had his radioactive material. That's right. Americium is, um, I looked up why it would be in smoke detectors. Did you see why? No. It's really interesting. Just for a second. So uh, americium, because of its radioactive decay, it creates a flow of ions um, positive and negative ions that are, are moved across like this metal plate. And there's a constant movement of ions that this americium is creating from the air around it. And when smoke interacts with those ions, it actually breaks that flow. That flow is detected by the smoke detector, which triggers it to go off. Isn't that just so bizarre? That's how your smoke detector works. And that's how they still work? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's still americium in smoke detectors today. Amazing. Yeah. So you said he built his own Geiger counter. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if it was this one or if he ended up getting another one, but he would drive around Upper Michigan uh, with this Geiger counter on, just looking for naturally occurring uranium out in the world. And then eventually he's like, this isn't working out. So he got a Czechoslovakian firm uh, that the NRC told him about and sourced uranium ore. Yeah, he had that Geiger counter mounted to his dashboard, and apparently any time he drove, he had it turned on. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, I mean, that's you got to find this stuff. And he actually did find some stuff. It's called Pitch Blend, and it's a, it's a source of low-grade um, uranium. And he tried to extract it, but he couldn't purify it enough. So like you said, he was like, well, I'll just buy some pure uranium from a firm in Czechoslovakia that he heard about either from the pamphlet or from Donald Erb, one of the two. Yeah, another thing he did was uh, the little mantle, like the little mesh sacks that you tie onto a gas lantern. Mm -hmm. Uh, He bought thousands of those because they have little tiny amounts of uh, thorium-232. And uh, so, you know, he buys thousands of these from surplus stores, buys thousands of dollars in lithium batteries to extract lithium. So he's being very, um, you know, uh, 
I think showing a lot of initiative yeah. and at least how to find this stuff. Yeah, I mean, like he's using his his after school um, job money to buy a thousand dollars in lithium batteries to purify the thorium that he got from the gas lanterns that he purchased and extracted it from. Like, I can't imagine how much time and effort this took. And by the way, he did purify that thorium pretty well. I saw that he got it to nine thousand times the level found in nature of radioactivity and about 170 times the level that you would need a license from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to possess. He also went around, of course, where you're going to find uh, old, dangerous, radioactive things, Mm -hmm. uh, junkyards and antique shops. So he would take that uh, Geiger counter into a junk shop or an antique store, and he would walk around until something lit up, uh, like radium paint, uh, if you remember our um, I think it was a pretty excellent podcast on the Radium Girls. Mm-hmm. And he would find, like, radium paint in an old clock. Yeah. Um, yeah, he found a, a vial of paint just tucked away inside of one. And that then he really had his radioactive material for his neutron gun. Um, he actually stepped it up and built a second gun. He'd also, from corresponding with Donald Erb, gotten even better at creating a neutron gun that was going to— um, be useful in creating a nuclear reaction. Um, He also found that uh, when he used the the radium on, on, um, I think, the thorium that he purified, he was trying to trigger a chain reaction by bombarding thorium with neutrons. That's what he was trying to do. Um, He found that the thorium wasn't converting into uranium like it was supposed to. So he contacted Donald Erb, and Donald Erb said, your neutrons are too fast. you got to slow them down. One of the best ways to slow them down is tritium. And he said, well, where would I find tritium? And apparently they use tritium to make the glowing sights on gun scopes and gun sights. So he ordered, I think, dozens of gun sights from mail order catalogs from stores. And then he would scrape the tritium off and then send them back and say, I need this this sight repaired. There's no tritium on it. And they would put more tritium on it and send it back. And he'd just create a new pseudonym and send that back in. That's how methodical that kid was. So this is all kid stuff. He's like 14, 15 years old. Right. Eventually, he turns 17, and he says, all right, I think I want to build an actual nuclear reactor. Uh, it's called a tiny breeder reactor. Uh, they've been around since the early 1950s when the U.S. developed them, uh, when we were you know, sort of the beginning of the age of trying to use nuclear power for electricity. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, these little tiny breeder reactors might be a good way to extend the supply of fuel or something. Um, it never quite worked out that way. Uh, I think they're still working on that kind of thing in Russia and China, but it never really cut, went off the ground. But it was enough to inspire David to think that maybe I can build a small thing like this in in my mom's potting garage or a potting shed. Yeah. The difference between a breeder reactor and a regular reactor is that you, um, in a regular reactor, you just use fuel and you get energy from the fuel. With the breeder reactor, you get energy from the fuel, but it also creates more fuel, and you end up with more fuel than you started with. Uh, I saw it um, likened to leaving your house with a car with a half a tank of gas, and when you return home, the, um, the, the tank is full. That's kind of like what it does, and yet they just could never get it to work. But that's what he was trying to do, and the reason why is because you start with uranium-238, and that's the most abundant uranium found in nature. That's right. So he he doesn't have enough uranium, no matter what kind it is, to create an actual uh, chain reaction for a normal reactor. So he says, maybe I can at least do something. Like he, he It seemed like he became sort of obsessed just mm-hmm. with this goal of creating some kind of nuclear reaction yeah. himself. Yeah. Uh, got a blueprint from one of his dad's textbooks, took that uh, americium and the radium from his neutron guns, mixed it with some aluminum shavings, some beryllium. Wrap that up in aluminum foil, and basically you have yourself a, a very small reactor core right there. Yeah, he created an atomic pile, like the first one that Fermi created in Chicago, but on a much, much smaller scale. But it worked. Like, it worked. He created, like you said, a nuclear reactor, and it started a nuclear chain reaction. And it started to take off, actually, pretty quickly. Yeah, he's got that Geiger counter, and he's measuring this thing like on a daily basis, and he's like, it's actually growing. Like, it's getting more radioactive in here. Uh, I imagine he was thrilled and also possibly a little bit like 
Matthew Broderick in War Games where it's like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> like, what have I done here? Uh, such that he was worried and took it apart. He did. Apparently, he could detect it from five houses down the street. And I looked up um, pictures of Golf Manor. And I mean, their yards are decent size. So five houses away is a pretty good distance to be able to pick up his um, nuclear reactor in his mom's potting shed with his Geiger counter. And at that big point, side yards there. Yeah, lots of big side <laughs> yards. <laughs> um, no zero lot lines. No, 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 nothing like that. No, this is Golf Manor, man, that we're talking about. Um, so he took it apart and he just kind of distributed the different parts to try to drop the, the radioactivity levels in his mom's potting shed. And uh, he kind of went about his life after he, he um, disassembled his reactor. He'd achieved his goal, um, but apparently he had a penchant for stealing wheels and tires off of cars. Um, he ab- admitted as much in an interview later on uh, as, as an adult. And he, he seems to have gotten caught doing that by the police uh, shortly after he disassembled his reactor. And when the police caught him, they, they said, Look, we're going to search your car. And he said, go ahead, search my car, but do not open that toolbox. That toolbox is highly radioactive. Is that a good cliffhanger for a break? I think so. Imagine the cops going, what? <laughs> They're like, we got to listen to ads before we know what happens? Mm-hmm. Sorry. All right, we'll be right back. All right, so it's August, uh, almost September, uh, 1994. That reactor is uh, taken apart. I think he put the thorium in a shoebox. Uh, (laughs) The radium in the americium was in the shed still, Mm -hmm. and the rest is in the trunk of his car. He's just been pulled over, like you said, because uh, there was reports that he was stealing uh, tires and wheels. And he said, warning, that thing's radioactive. Don't open up that, uh, that toolbox. So they said, well, maybe we should, this sounds like an, an IED to me, mm-hmm. uh, an improvised explosive device. Why don't we call in the bomb squad to be safe? Called in the bomb squad. They said, this whole car basically is radioactive. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the Federal Radiological Emergency Response Plan is triggered. And the EPA and the FBI and the NRC and the DOE are, and the state and local authorities are all like, trying to not trying to get this kid but trying to figure out what in the world is going on with this kid. Yeah, he's 17 at the time still and all of a sudden these huge agencies are like swooping down on him to figure out what's going on. The thing is I I guess they didn't think to an- ask the right questions or their imaginations just didn't go as far as they could have, but they seem to have in this initial questioning not really have gotten any further than his car. And he didn't offer up any information whatsoever about his actual, like, nuclear reaction experiments in his mom's potting shed. They didn't even know there was a potting shed at his mom's that's house at this really point. That's really hard to believe. Yes, but that's the level of questioning that this kid was subjected to. And, I mean, in retrospect, you're like, are you guys kidding? You didn't know about the potting shed right off the bat? But if you're an FBI agent or a Department of Energy agent and you're talking to a 17-year-old kid— you're probably not going to assume that because they have this stuff in a toolbox in their car, they actually were successfully creating nuclear chain reactions in their mom's potting shed. I can kind of commiserate with that. Sure. You probably assume he just got it at Radiation R Us. Pretty much. <laughs> uh, so a few months later is when uh, they finally got an expert from the State Department of Public Health to interview David uh, more thoroughly, and that turned up the potting shed. Uh, David's mom at this point had gathered um, most of the um, radioactive stuff and gotten rid of it. I I imagine not in a very safe way at all. No. Probably just went in the trash can. Uh, And they still found a lot of radiation at the house in the materials there in the shed. They had the, apparently there was a vegetable can that had about a thousand times uh, the normal background radiation. And so they called in federal authorities and they said, 
Well, your house is a, well, the potting shed at least is a super fun site. Yeah. Um, they ended up spending 60 grand on a two, three day operation between June 26th and 28th of 1995, disassembling the potting shed. I think getting some of the earth around it out of there, putting them in sealed barrels with, you know, radio, um, radioactive hazard symbols on it. And they sent it to um, the Great Salt Lake Desert where they were buried with other canisters of low-level radio, radioactive waste. Um, it, his mom's potting shed is in the Great Salt Lake Desert buried with other radioactive material. That's kind of yeah. neat. The, the real stuff, though, like you said, it ended up in, like, the landfill nearby. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was a quote from David that I saw where he said um, – the 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 authorities got the garbage and the garbage got the good stuff in reference yeah. to what his mom had thrown away. So yeah, there's some lumps of americium and uh, radium sitting somewhere in the, the garbage pile outside of Clinton Commerce Township. And what's in like a thousand years it'll be safe? Probably something like that. I was just, I don't know how long that would be. I bet somebody knows so. Oh, they'll write in. So uh, David falls into a depression after this. Uh, his high school uh, classmates were not kind to him, of course. Um, they called him Radioactive Boy. Uh, the EPA said, hi, we should, you know, we can examine you and your body to see if you're okay. He said, no, 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 I don't want anything to do with that. I'll be fine. Uh, he did get that Eagle Scout badge. Um, I think the scout leaders were like, should we really do this? Um, but they did. They gave him that Eagle Scout badge. And uh, no, apparently the, the neighborhood, his uh, all those huge side yards came in handy because no one in the neighborhood and no one at the home or in his family apparently ever suffered from any kind of radiation sickness. That is so lucky. Yeah. Like, that is really lucky for him and for everybody. But he, no one got hurt. Um, that's just mind-boggling at this point. Um, he went on and joined the Navy a couple of years later, um, and he served for several years, was honor honorably discharged, and ironically served on the USS Enterprise, which is a nuclear submarine, but he didn't work in any capacity near the nuclear part of the submarine. Um, he, I think he fully served his time in the Navy, He did. Actually. Yeah, he was on honorably discharged. Uh, no, no, no. I think, I think he was discharged from the Marines. I think he, like, he fully served— his time in the Navy. Oh, I thought they... Like he, they I, he was never discharged. I thought they discharged you when your time was up, too. No, you just, you're just done. But they, you like, just... Like, a discharge means it's time for you to go, and then you're like, wait, I got three more years, and they're like, no, it's time for you to go. Gotcha. Okay, I gotcha. All right, so, yes, in between the Navy and the Marines, he went to college uh, and started working on an associate's degree. Uh, like you said, he joined the Marines. He was honor, honorably discharged, um, and his life was just not going the way he wanted it to. He, um, 2007 found him unemployed. Um, his mental illness had really kind of kicked in. Uh, and toward the end of his life, spoiler alert, he, uh, he died at age 39. Um, there was a, an FBI report on him where somebody had been informing on him that he was not using his meds, that he was heavily using cocaine, and that he was acting really paranoid. Um, from what I can tell, Based on the FBI documents, it seems like the person informing on him seems concerned, not like they're doing it out of any kind of vengeful reason. Right. But that, yeah. that when the FBI showed up and interviewed him, again, this is when he's in his 30s, um, they, he, he, he passed all of the inspection or uh, queries that they gave him, questioning that they gave him. Yeah, and there were, you know, there were other complaints and reports uh, with the police that, you know, he was trying to do this again, that he had a small reactor at his house. Uh, another landlord, I think, said that he had stolen some smoke detectors uh, that they were missing and they found them, um, like, you know, torn apart, basically, uh, near David's garage. But they never, they never found any kind of radiation. Mm -hmm. He said he hadn't done that kind of stuff in a decade. And, you know, they went and checked like where he was living, and they never found any evidence that he had at least started up any more radioactive work. Yeah, imagine during your FBI um, questioning, you're like, I haven't done any nuclear reactions at home for like 10 years, man. That's right. like, that is a <laughs> yeah. different chat. It's like a whole lifetime ago. Teenage stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, the FBI documents also give um, just kind of a sad note in 2010, which is where the FBI's investigation of, of him as an adult left off based on those complaints. Um, they noted that he was in rehab after being charged with a bunch of drug charges. So apparently the cocaine use thing was true. Um, that was 2010. Six years later, uh, like I said, he was dead at, at um, age 39. Yeah. So uh, in the media, of course, initially, there were some people that said that the radioactivity did him in or that was a factor, at least. Uh, very sadly, the the report came back. That wasn't true. But he died from combined effects of alcohol and fentanyl uh, and Benadryl. And he suffered from mental, uh, mental illness, just like his mom, I think, from uh, paranoid schizophrenia and depression. Mm. And it's just a very sad end to a Story of a kid who who sounds like he was really smart and just wanted to try and do something really amazing, you know? Yeah. Um, he, he was found dead in the bathroom at a Walmart that he had gone shopping in the night he died. Um, and it is a sad end. I don't, I don't quite know what to make of it, Chuck. Like, uh, Same. It, it's, if he were still alive, I don't know. I think it would be a, a much different story somehow. Yeah, but he did something. Agreed. I don't know. Maybe it's the story of somebody who was just so single-minded. They they did something that most other people would have given up on or never even attempted, and that's worth mentioning. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I tried to look at other angles. I just I never saw anything like nefarious, really. No, no. Either an FBI interview or a media interview. The interviewer was like, "I mean, were you thinking of making a bomb or whatever?" And they they said they reported like. He seemed to just be like, that never even crossed my mind. Like, no, that's not at all what yeah. I was doing. He was just obsessed with creating a nuclear reaction, and he did it. Yeah. Well, uh, thankfully, we don't have to end it on that sad note because Livia found this other great story uh, of a, a kid named Taylor Wilson who got the Radioactive Boy Scout uh, book from his grandmother as an 11-year-old science kid. Mm -hmm and operating under supervision and oversight and getting real experts to help uh, actually became the youngest person to achieve nuclear fusion at the age of 14. Yeah, which is amazing. I mean, fusion's a whole new ball game. But yeah, yeah. 14. And works as a, a nuclear physicist as an adult. Yeah, and it's supposedly, according to The Guardian, a super cool dude, too. Yeah, and directly inspired from uh, David's story. Yeah, and apparently his grandmother lived to regret it, again, according to The Guardian. Oh, um, really? Yeah, that's what The Guardian said. Uh, because I guess his grandmother was giving it to him as a cautionary tale, and he's like, oh, I want to try this myself. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, Taylor Wilson's grandmother is the 11th person we need to thank in this episode, Taylor Wilson being 10 and Donald Erb being number 9. Right. <laughs> nice work. Uh, if you want to know more about the nuclear or radioactive Boy Scout David Hahn, there's a lot of stuff out there, um, but you uh, would be remiss in not reading Ken Silverstein's um, article, at least if not his book on David Hahn. Uh, and while you're looking that up, we'll just go ahead and do listener mail. All right, this is from Tiffany. Uh, hey, guys, thank you for bringing back some vivid memories from my eighth grade reading class. Uh, too many decades ago to admit but my reading teacher was also the social studies teacher, and I guess that explains why all of our reading lists included Animal Farm, Hiroshima, All Quiet on the Western Front, and you know it, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Uh, to hammer home what we read, he would incorporate details of the book into a little imaginary coin toss he did each day to determine whether the boys or girls got to go first and uh, walk to lunch in single file line. For the weeks we discussed The Jungle, it would sound something like this. Today's menu includes hot dogs. Call it in the air. Is it the rusty nail or the severed finger? Mm. What a great teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, one day we noticed that half the kids in the class had an edition of the book that included this. Uh, and yes, I still remember it decades later. Mary had a little lamb. And when she saw it sicken, she sent it off to the packing town. And now it's labeled chicken. <laughs> I was really hoping you guys had seen this so we could hear a recitation during the podcast, but uh, we just did it right there, Tiffany. That's great. Yeah, we I didn't run across that. I didn't either. That's a great ad. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tiffany. Uh, that's a great email, and we appreciate it big time. And hats off to your teacher, the 13th person we need to thank in this episode. You're number 12, <laughs> Tiffany. Can we thank Jerry? 
Sure, why not? We'll right. go with 14. We could thank ourselves and just bring it up to 16, a nice even number. Sweet 16. Uh, we're going to make it 17 because we want to thank you for listening, and we want to thank you in advance for getting in touch with us via email at stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Listener.